Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sheree, and hey, thanks everybody for joining us today. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Also, check out the new Two Million Blossoms podcast available from, where, from her website or from wherever you download and, and stream your shows. Hey, Kim. We're approaching the end of July. I can't believe we're here already. Yeah, it's July weather, that's for sure. If it's not hot, it's raining, and often it's both. I know just last, not, just not so long ago, I was complaining about 100 degree heat, and today it's not even 70 yet. It's it's weird. Oh, not even 70. Not even 70. Global a, weirding, I tell you. Global weirding. Go <laughs> <laughs> so how are your bees hanging out? Well, that's what they're doing. Are they? They're hanging out yeah. because it's hot. Um, I've got sh- some shade and I've got ventilation and, and so they're not doing too bad, but, uh, the bigger colonies are, there's a lot of bees on the front door. Yeah. You and Jim and Honey Bee Obscure just did an episode on dealing with hot bees in the summer. Uh, that, that was a good, good episode. Yeah, we did. And, and, uh, well, he and I have, are having the same problem this year and, and not only that, but, uh, not only what are they doing, but how cranky they get sometimes when it's hot. <laughs> Um, the, bee, the bees get a, cranky or the beekeepers get cranky? Well, the, the bees get cranky and the beekeeper gets tired and and old and wet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Defines a beekeeper. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, um, so well, that's good. Uh, uh, Honey Bee Obscure is really a, a great podcast you guys are putting out. Uh, Jim also has been doing some uh, video moments. And uh, I encourage our listeners, if you haven't been watching and listening to uh, Honey Bee Obscure, get out there and listen to him and uh, check out the, the occasional video moment that is also associated with each episode. He does a good job of those, doesn't he? He really does. They're entertaining. I really enjoy watching them. He's got a lot of background in doing video. He did that whole, whole series uh, when he was in extension at uh, the Ohio State University. And uh, so he's got the equipment. He's got the experience. He's he does a good job. Yeah, really good. I'm gl- glad he's on the team. Hey Kim, we've received a couple questions this uh, in the last couple of weeks. From uh, one is from uh, Elizabeth Irving, and she wanted to know. Uh, you referred to a book uh, about bee behavior from observing the outside of a colony, and what was that? Yeah, it, it's a book. It's called. It's by the author is H. Storch, S T O R C H, mm-hmm. and it's uh, the title is at the hive entrance. At the hive entrance, and it's what you can learn by look by watching what's going on at the hive entrance. He did a good job. It's really old, but it's still good. Uh, I mean, he did a good job, and things haven't changed much. Bees still do what bees did then. <laughs> uh, you can get it at Northern Bee Books, you know, with uh, Jeremy uh, over in the UK. You can go to his webpage. And you can get the book there. Uh, And if you can't find it in a library someplace, 
I really suggest you take a look at it because uh, there's a lot you can, before you ever take the cup, before you even light your smoker, you can go out and take a look and see what do you suppose is going on there today. And a lot of the stuff that's going on, they can tell you that you can observe and figure out by just watching what's going on at the front door. Great. Well, we'll have that, you know, um, uh, Northern Bee Books isn't a a sponsor, but for our listeners, we will post a listing uh, uh, title of that book and the link to Northern Bee Books in the show notes. Good. Look for that. She also had a second question about, well, it'd be easier for me just to read it. So let me let me go ahead and read this and you can re- give a quick reply. She says, I understand that bees have different jobs at different points in their life. I have a hive full of nectar that needs to be evaporated and it's a rainy week. The foragers are stuck inside. Do the house bees recruit foragers to do inside work? Or are the bees like, well, we can't get outside, so we'll get into the supers in a very and, and get them in very good order. And do the bees continue their housework at night? If I go out and press my ear to the wooden boxes, I can hear them talking to themselves no matter what the weather or time of day. So many questions. Being a bee being a bee is complicated. So <laughs> <laughs> it sure it it sure is. Well, the, the the thing about do bee foragers do inside housework, and um, for the most part, probably not, because because they have graduated past that. Their their uh, um, you know their flight muscles have changed. The the pheromones that they respond to have changed. Their be you know their behaviors have changed. They're a forager, mm-hmm. and and the the bees inside that are that are dehydrating the honey that are taking care of the queen that are feeding the baby bees their their glands are equipped to do those things or a forager if a forager got stuck in a hive for a long time and or um, suddenly a lot of the house bees disappeared for some reason like a pesticide poisoning some of the foragers would revert back and be able to produce wax and be able to produce brood food those sorts of things but for a, a day or two or three, uh, probably they're just kind of hanging out, um, going, "Hey, I got the day off, cool." And that's why we see the bee birds. Well, that's one of the reasons. Yeah. If if <clears throat> if you get a lot of bees and it's warm inside, they're going to go outside and and stay out there so that it's easier to keep the inside. So the inside doesn't overheat. Mm-hmm. That's what you don't want to have happen. They're not, you know, it's warm in there, and you don't want it to get too warm because then you start getting problems with the brood. All right. There you go, Elizabeth. Hope that helps. Hey, Kim, uh, I, one of the things having sponsors gives us the privilege of doing is provides transcripts of each episode. So uh, if anybody has is hard of hearing or knows beekeepers who would benefit from the information in our podcast, but can't listen to them, doesn't enjoy listening to them because it's hard to hear, they can. you can go out to our podcast webpage and look at transcripts and read transcripts. Um, it's a pretty good service, isn't it, Kim? Yeah, it is. And it's not only for people like me who, you know, don't hear so well, but it's good for uh, people that are just hearing this subject for the first time and want to read along so they make sure they catch every word. Um, and, and, and for, like, people just starting out that don't know a lot of things, you, you have a record of what was said. Yeah, uh, I encourage you. Uh, Folks, if you if you use the transcripts or you know beekeepers who do, let us know. It's a it's a, a valuable service. It's expensive, <laughs> but we we think it's it's money well spent and and it provides a, an additional service or avenue of education for uh, all beekeepers. Yep, it does. Today we have a professor there from in your part of the country, uh, Dr. Gene Kritsky. I'm looking forward to having him on. Yeah, he. I've known I've known him for quite a while. Uh, I met him. He's uh, down in Cincinnati. He's a professor and the dean of the Behavioral and Natural Sciences uh, Department at Mount Saint Joseph University in Cincinnati. And he's written a, a, a handful of books, a big handful of books on a variety of topics. I got to know him when he wrote a book called uh, In Search of the Perfect Hive. And he was looking at the history of the hives and, and where it might be going from where it is today. And we were at quite a few shows together um, in the vendor area. He's selling his books and I was selling our books. So 
Uh, that's where I got to know him. But since then, I have found out that he is a specialist in a whole variety of things other than the history of the hive. And I think we're going to explore a bunch of those today. Yeah. I was doing some reading up on uh, before he came on, and he's kind of like the Indi- Indiana Jones of entomologist. <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. He does he does history, he does hive types, he does other insects. He's he's just uh he's a real interesting guy and I think I, I hope we can draw out as much as we can with him today. I'm looking forward to it. All right, well let's uh hear from our friends at Strong Microbials and get into our interview with Dr. Gene Kritsky. Hello beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. And while you're at the Strong Microbials website, make sure you click on The Hive, their regular newsletter full of information and product updates. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is doctor and author Gene Kritsky. Welcome to Beekeeping Today show, Gene. Glad to be here. It's good to get good to see you again, Gene. It's been too long. That's for certain, Kim. Congratulations on the ABC XYZ. That's a, a wonderful piece of work. Um, uh, did you notice the blood all over it? Yes. <laughs> I also noticed a couple tears, but uh, it, it, it was uh, well wor- well worth the wait. Uh, it was it was a task and a half, um, but I'm glad it's done. And thank you. Well, you have a chapter in that too, don't you, Gene? I've got I've got seven entries in there, I believe. Yeah, I saw one. Yeah, that sounds about <laughs> right. That sounds about right. I I've forgotten already. There's that's the quiz for later. I talked about I think it's Slovenia, modern Egypt, a number of the hives, skeps, yep. things like that. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, that, what a great lead in. So. We welcome you to the show today, Gene. We're going to talk to you a little bit about your background, and and and, and basically, we'll talk about uh, well the the topic of the summer is the cicada, and and you're a resident expert of the cicada. Uh, you do have a background in Egyptology and and uh, Egypt and and keeping bees, which would be great. And you know, just coincidentally, we just finished our this last spring. We finished our five part series on different hive types, other than the Langstroth, and you have a a long uh, background in different hive types, so and you've written about that. So we want to just touch base on that as well, all in the space of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gene, the cicada is clear and loud in a lot of places right now, and and you have a new book on it called Periodical Cicadas: The Brood X Edition, and you've got actually several uh, publications on on cicadas. Uh, is this year's, is this year's brood as good as the last one that they had? Uh, is it better, worse, bigger, smaller? I get that question a lot. It's kind of an interesting question. It varies on where you are and the, and the local history of uh, the trees and, and what have you, but it's been a textbook emergence. It started, uh, here in Southwest Ohio on the, uh, a few places had some numbers come out on the 15th of May at, at uh, my house. We had them come out on the 17th and, uh, uh, it started out really strong, and then the cold temperatures sort of slowed things down a little. But then we had some nice heat, and uh, it, it's been textbook. Uh, right now, the cicadas are uh, beginning to dwindle. They're on the downhill slide. They uh, they've been singing and mating, and the females are laying eggs. And uh, the sound intensity dropped from two weeks ago at 90 decibels to today. It was probably about uh, I want to say 68 to 72. Amazing. And and the population you think is about about right the population is pretty good uh we have seen some local declines in in uh due to things like uh, people treating their ash trees for the emerald ash borer uh that's with the systemic uh injected insecticide and uh, uh i got an email just yesterday from a a woman who had uh 
had her trees treated, her trees treated yesterday. And after they left, she was watching the cicadas that were on the trees, getting liquid out, uh, dropping over the next several hours after a day or so, they started dropping like crazy. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, uh, that, that she was a little, she was a little bummed about that. And so I'm not sure if she's going to keep her, her trees, uh, uh, treat, keep treating her trees or not, but, um, at least she felt, I don't want to say at least she felt bad. Like it was a good thing, but at least she was <laughs> conscious about the cicadas. Well, they, uh, I know that there can be some damage to, to a uh, fruit tree of all any, uh, many kinds of trees. If you get a big population and, and they can be, What's the word? Pestiferous on occasion? On occasion. They're very mostly dangerous to small saplings, trees that are usually four or five feet in height or smaller. Uh, there was a paper published in the original American entomologist back in 1869 that was titled, Out of Evil, Come of Good. <laughs> and, it all, and it was all about how, how orchardists in uh, Illinois and Missouri were noticing a bumper crop in their fruit trees this year. And they couldn't attribute to what it, they were. They, they didn't know what they'd done that, that they'd like to do again. And it turned out the year before was a major emergence to, of two broods of periodical skaters, brood 19 and brood 10. And uh, the egg laying was intense and a lot of overposition scars on those trees, but it turned out it acted like a natural pruning. Hmm. And so the next year, the, the, the flower, the leaf set, the flower set in particular was larger than they'd seen in the typical years. And so, uh, uh, they had a, a bumper crop in 1869. And so the cicadas were thought to have uh, done something good for a change. I'll be darned. That's, that's, that's amazing. That, that, that. <laughs> so, so your book on, on brood X, um, tells, a, it has a lot of things. The thing I liked, I got the most information from was the, the maps. How, how, mm -hmm. how do you gather that in that much information on maps, on the maps that you provide? Well, the maps are, uh, uh, I, I, I am a frustrated historian. And if you see anything that runs through all my books, it's, it's a sense of history. And uh, uh, the first record of periodical skaters goes back to 1634 when they emerged uh, in Plymouth Colony. And that was reported by the uh, second governor of Plymouth Colony, William Bradford. And uh, the first time brewed, brewed 10, uh, the X is a Roman numeral. Uh, but uh, I have to admit, Kim, Brood X sounds sexier. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's like the murder hornet. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, uh, and and uh, we've got records going on uh, from, a from that time on. In fact, I wouldn't have been writing about bees or anything if it wasn't for periodical cicadas because uh, I was originally an anthropology major. I wanted to study human evolution. And I was asking my professor, uh, well, we've got these two skulls. It's, you know, it's a sample of one for each. How do you know they're not just male and female, what have you? And he started talking about morphometrics and these statistical analyses. And I looked at him, I must've looked totally confused because he said, well, you ought to take an entomology class because that's where they're doing that now. And this is back in 1972. Uh, so uh, I was a sophomore. I went to register for classes and the, the way they did that in those days, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have the web. We actually went to this giant field house and we collected computer cards and we walked in lines <laughs> and what have you. And the K's were the last group of the, all the cohorts to go through registration. And everything was closed. You know. And I walked up to the uh, the table of zoology and I said, I need five hours. Is anything open? And the woman said, I'm sorry. All I have is entomology in the lab. And that's that was it. So uh, that, 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 that meant so I took entomology. And the second week of the class, my uh, professor was Frank Young. And he and I have written a book together, a, a, a book together and several papers together. Uh, started talking about these cicadas. And I, whoa. This is just really awesome. And what hit me was the idea that if you use, you know, we use the scientific method every day in, in apiculture. You make observations, you come up with an idea, you test it with whatever you practice you're going to do, and then you, you either reject or accept that and continue building on your knowledge from there. In history, they have a historical method. And uh, it's you, you look for primary sources written in the person's own handwriting, secondary sources, transcriptions, tertiary uh, sources where they're let's say like newspaper articles. And then you evaluate the source. Is it the original person or is it somebody that's hearsay and what have you? And that's the historical method. And it hit me that I could, if I could use the tools of history to find historical emergences of cicadas, I could not just have one map from one year. I could have maps that encompasses several emergences. And so while in grad school at the university of Illinois, uh, and I worked with, uh, uh, 
Lou Standard, who was the skate specialist at Illinois. I never got the opportunity to take a, a, a class from Jay Cox. Boy, did I want to, but it just, just didn't work out. Uh, the, uh, I, I started to amass a collection of historical records. And by the time I finished my PhD, uh, I had 7,000 records of previous emergencies of periodical skaters <laughs> that I put into a computer program and I kind of started seeing patterns. So brood one was a pattern one of one location. Brood two was a different location. Brood three was out West and so on. And looking at those, like you could look at a map, it was all the emergencies in 1634 that were known. Or I could look at two emergencies and then the next two and the next two and see how patterns developed. And that's what uh, my research on cicadas uh, evolved into was basically looking at how the broods relate to each other, how they evolve. And uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's, it, it also took my interest into history, which led to my uh, interest in beekeeping. Although I became uh, a beekeeper uh, through an indirect route, I uh, uh, started as a bee inspector looking for bacterial diseases, working for the state of Indiana. And uh, so I went that route to begin, but, but fell, but the first I put the, I put the, the veil on and I had that limited peripheral vision. You all know what I mean. <laughs> and you're smelling the smoke. And the first thing you open that hive and you get that smell of a healthy hive. And it's that, that sweet wax, the honey, and you're, you're trying to be smooth in the way you handle things. Cause you don't want to jar the, the hives. Meanwhile, the, the beekeeper is looking at me over <laughs> and shoulder to see what I'm going to do to see how fast I got that smoker lit all the t- tests you have to do to show, you know, what you're doing. But I just fell in love with that whole protocol. And the idea that this is a science that essentially we're still using hives that essentially, you know, the guts of it were produced in 1851 theoretically. And then modified about 20 years later and so on. And that just, that the connection to history really got me. And so uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's how I got the maps to answer your first question. <laughs> but it also uh, led to my reading a book by Ava Crane, uh, The uh, uh, Archaeology of Beekeeping. That, that, that changed everything for me. An interesting connection, a very interesting connection. And I was, I was well, I have one more cicada question. And is, really? is anything that they do going to be bad for beekeepers? It doesn't sound like it, but um, I, I, doubt, I don't know. It only happens once every 10 years. Uh, it's the, well, it's, uh, uh, we don't, there, there's never been a reported uh, instance of where cicadas interfered with, with uh, honeybees. I'm sure possibly some bivouacking swarm somewhere might have you know, picked the wrong tree and startled a bunch of cicadas. Maybe that might have <laughs> happened. But no, there, there doesn't seem to be any adverse effects uh, between uh, uh, honeybees and, and uh, the cicadas, which is quite beneficial because I'm fond of both of them and I wouldn't want to create a ruckus in the family. There you go. Well, <laughs> that's, that's good that uh, they don't get in each other's way. But the beekeeping part of it, um, which is how I first met you was when you came out, you've got several books on the history of, of bees and beekeeping, hives and hive types, uh, the quest for the perfect hive, of course, the tears of Ray from Egypt. Um, and, and, um, uh, Jeff will have your webpage on, on, uh, the show notes. But, uh, one of the things that you mentioned on your webpage is you got locked in an Egyptian tomb. That is true. Uh, that's in part, I think, where the idea that I was the Indiana Jones of cicadas came about. <laughs> <laughs> now, I used to live in Egypt. I was the uh, uh, a Fulbright scholar to Egypt in uh, uh, 81 to 82. Uh, I was there when uh, Sadat was assassinated. And it might have been 80, 81, but uh, it was because uh, I was 80, 83. It was 80, 81. Uh, I was a Fulbright scholar teaching at Minya University, part of the Camp David Accords that were signed by President Carter and, and Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin was that there'd be more Fulbrighters into the provinces. Almost all the American Fulbrighters in Egypt wanted to live in Cairo. And there were a, a number of universities that were out in the, in the provinces. And one in particular was Minya, about 150 miles south of Cairo. And they requested an entomologist. And I have always had an interest in, in ancient Egypt and uh, that I thought, well, this is a great. My whole idea was to go there. I would be teaching some classes, but also do some research on insects as a hieroglyphic motif. And that that's that led quickly to the honey because it's one of the, probably the most common insect hieroglyph that's out there. But uh, uh, while I was there, the uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to the to Egypt at the time was uh, uh, Roy, uh, Roy Atherton. I think his name was. Uh, I'm not sure if the, 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 if that name is correct. 
but he, he, his wife was on the Fulbright Commission. And they were going to take his son on a tour of the antiquities of Egypt. And so they told me that they were coming down with, with his son and they would like to invite me to come along. And I thought it would be just like, you know, small, you know, small band of us. No, here comes this motorcade, a military escort with his excellency, the ambassador uh, and uh, uh, his wife. And, and of course, wherever that we stop, uh, they all had to post their pictures with, with the ambassador. And so Reed, his son, who was uh, in his early 20s, you know, I said, hey, let's go, let's go look at the antiquities. I'd been to these sites many times by this time. And we were at Tuna El Gebel, which is an underground uh, necropolis where they found bunch of, hundreds of mummified ibis birds and baboons. It was a, a necropolis dedicated to the god Thoth, which is the ibis-headed bird uh, man that also invented hieroglyphs and the record keeper for the afterlife and so on. And so we were in there. Well, they, of course, there's pictures going on in front of all the major sites in the necropolis. And I said to, to Reed, I said, let's go back. There's a sarcophagus back about 40 yards and down a shaft. And so we off back we go. While we're in there, uh, a sandstorm, a hamsin, uh blew up. And uh, so we went for about 25 minutes. And there were two guards with us as well. To, I don't know why that we needed guards. We were going over. And uh, as we come up, we out, everybody's gone. And the door is locked. <laughs> And I, the two guards are banging on the door going, Mufta, Mufta, which is key in Arabic. And I look at Reed and, and you, you look at the, it wasn't like a sealed tomb that you're going to suffocate in an hour or so. You could, you could see a gaping hole and you could look out <laughs> in the door and look out and you couldn't see two feet. The sandstorm was so thick. So being in the, in the necropolis uh, uh, was probably one of the safest places to be. So I said to Reed, let's go down that shaft. I've never explored that one before. Meanwhile, the guards are banging on the door. And uh, we went down this one uh, side shaft uh, and a corridor, and we found a, a, a coffin for an ibis bird and a crocodile skull, mummy linen all over the place. Of course, we couldn't keep any of that, obviously. But it was just neat to realize that here, how many people have the opportunity to be locked in an Egyptian tomb and have the opportunity to go poking around? <laughs> and of course, uh, they finally, after about 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere there, they, they come in and lock the door and they had nice wet towels, not for me, but for the ambassador's son. They pushed me out of the way, wrapped him up in a wet towel and off they went. And I sort of stumbled on behind him. I think the question is, the question is how many have had an opportunity to be locked into a, a necropolis like that and then walk out? <laughs> That's probably true. A lot of people <laughs> that go true. in and never come out. <laughs> but it's, it was one of those things that uh, I'll never forget. Oh, Definitely. Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. That that ties, of course, uh, right into the uh, the books that you've produced on on the history and and um, the Tears of Ray, as I, as I mentioned, was one of them. Is that where you got? Is that when and where you got that information? The, a lot of a, a good part of it. Uh, I was I was there for a little about ten and a half months and visited ninety four archaeological sites, and of course I was taking notes constantly about anything that had to do with any of the insects. Uh, but I've since taken four student groups and friends of the museum back on tours of Egypt. Uh, so I've been back four times in the last, uh, four times probably in the last uh, 15 years I've been back and I'm making plans to return again because they always find more stuff. There's been mm-hmm. a tomb found at Saqqara of a, of a uh, overseer, the beekeepers, as I'm trying to get, get permission to get into. Uh, but uh, uh, it, 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 those four trips allowed me to visit places I couldn't get to when I was living there. And also to return to places that I wanted to see with the digital camera. Uh, and uh, 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 that was very helpful in getting the illustrations. From the deal notes in the Tears Array, I think almost probably 90% of the photographs and pictures I've taken, well, uh, either there or in museums around the world. Well, just briefly, can you outline the, the how beekeeping was working in Egypt? At that time, I mean, how how did they keep bees, and and how big did the operations get? That sort of thing. Certainly, the uh, the neat thing about uh, about beekeeping in ancient Egypt is it was a government run occupation. It uh, 
It, we, we have found evidence uh, in the, the literature from uh, tombs of the Rec Marais, which is the vizier, the, the, the prime minister, receiving honey in tribute uh, to, from all the provinces and, and uh, uh, surrounding kingdoms, honey being brought, brought to the, uh, the pharaoh. Uh, we also see uh, records of individuals. So uh, here in Ohio, we have at the Cleveland Art Museum a false door of uh, Anikara, uh, uh, who was a uh, uh, the overseer of the bees uh, in, in the provincial areas. And so here's his false door, and he, there's the part of the hieroglyph that talks of his, of his higher rank overseeing uh, beekeepers. And uh, we also have found a, a small scarab that talks about a chief beekeeper. There are letters in Greek during the Ptolemy times where people are, where they, they, uh, some people, they, the beekeepers had lent their donkeys to someone else to move some material. They needed them back to move their hives. And so they wrote this very kind letter. Are you, if you're done with them, we'd like our donkeys back because you have to move the hives to the next location and what have you. Uh, uh, as well as letters from uh, uh, some uh, uh, overseer saying the beekeepers in this particular pr- uh, area are not pulling their weight. The yields have not been as good as they should have been. And so uh, uh, they were looking at taking some kind of action. So very organized. And I find that just amazing because, and what that revealed to me, you think of ancient Egypt, you think of the pyramids and the Sphinx, and King Tut's tomb. Uh, that's not what the secret of Egypt is about. The secret of Egypt is to organ- or not just to build the pyramid, but to organize people to build the pyramid. That's that that civil structure where you can bring in twenty thousand people, house them, feed them, care for their wounds and the injuries and what have you, and over twenty years build a pyramid. That's impressive. The pyramid's just the results of what they did. But, you know, we can't, we, <laughs> you look at American politics today, <laughs> it, it's just, it's just, it's just, you know, what could we do if we had that kind of cooperation? I don't know. Amazing. Well, before we leave the Egyptians, and their, how were they keeping bees? Were they in the uh, clay tubes? Were they, uh, what kind of hive were they using back then? The, we have uh, the, the type of, the, the beehive that uh, uh, the ancient Egyptians kept, and we've got, uh, and again, let's, I, I define beekeeping as the uh, as the intentional provision of an artificial cavity within which bees, the queen, will uh, produce. They'll co- produce comb. The queen lays her eggs, and, and they produce the next generation and produce honey. It's uh, uh, that's the difference between beekeeping and honey hunting, which is just going off and and uh, uh, just robbing bees. Uh, we have in, at twenty four fifty BCE a wonderful relief at the uh, Sun Temple of uh, Nezere Ani, a fifth dynasty pharaoh. And it shows it, the, the scene that's in here, and the original is at the Neues Museum in Berlin. The scene shows all these activities that take place in different times of the year. And in the fall of the year, they had the scene where there's a, a beekeeper next to this wall of hives, tubular hives, as you mentioned, Jeff. Mm-hmm. That uh, And there's still these horizontal hives are still used today. There are about 7,000 still in existence in, in Egypt proper. Uh, there used to be millions about 25 years ago, So, but, but it's, it's down quite a bit. Uh, and uh, that we don't know what he's the, the beekeeper is doing because it's the, it's destroyed. There's some damage where he's right up next to the highs, but it looks like he's got a container and it's uh, the hieroglyph at the top says to slacken or to, uh, 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 to make a slight noise. And uh, some of the traditional Egyptian beekeepers actually call the queen can hear the, the piping and that tells them, Oh, there's more than one queen in here. And they'll go in there and do what they call essentially what they're doing is artificial swarming. They're going to go in there and they'll have several queens in one of these hives, take the queen out and some comb from other hives and actually stuff more tubes and get them going again by mm-hmm. manipulating the queen. I find that just amazing because we don't do things like that anymore. Uh, but they were doing that to 4,400 years ago. The uh, next scene that they have there is uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, individuals pouring what looks like pouring honey. And it, it, one of the, vessels is it looks like a it's a pot but there's a spout at the bottom and that is probably why how they got rid of uh, most of the the a lot of the, some of the wax for certain uh it's almost like a gravy se- a fat separator for gravy production where the the, the spouts at the bottom you let uh, I, I i did this i took some comb honey i crushed it put it in a container just set it in the hot sun and then about 40 minutes later there's a whole layer of wax at the top and the honey at the bottom you could decant the honey out from below it so uh, that's the that's a, as a process called experimental archaeology, where you try to test <laughs> a, uh, old techniques. And then, of course, to get the, uh, you still had this sort of sticky, waxy mass at the top. And they, uh, the Egyptians probably did the same that they did in ancient Greece, and that's uh, put it in water, bring it to a boil, and let it cool slowly, and all the wax just collected at the top. Uh, 
very nice and white. I, I redid that as well, and that works as well. The next scene is terribly damaged, and it just says to uh, uh, to squeeze, and that's probably further talking or showing about how to get rid of the, the separate the wax from the honey. And then the last scene is storing honey, and it shows vessels with the uh, all being wrapped up and what have you. Hmm. And that's one of four uh, major scenes of of uh, beekeeping uh, in ancient Egypt. But it tells us a couple things. One, the first hives uh, were horizontal. Uh, there are these tubes, uh, not dissimilar to the hives that were found by uh, my good friend Ami Mazar at the at Jerusalem Univers- Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, when he found those hives uh, that date to about 875 BCE, a few years back. And uh, uh, it, that uh, the uh, they had, I think, close to about 35, 40 hives in this one bank photograph that he showed me at one time uh, that were used primarily, I think, for wax production because it looked like uh, they were nearby the uh, uh, the copper mine where they were doing copper melting and uh, to for lost wax casting. And so that may have been what the major force there. But, of course, honey was a major commodity in ancient Egypt. Uh, they didn't have money. They didn't carry around coins. They had an idea of value of worth, and it was called the Deben. And it was the amount, the, the, the value of a vessel made from a, a, a piece of copper. They didn't carry the copper around, but there was a general agreement. Okay, you, a laborer would work for a bag of grain. And if, they, if the uh, his, his overseer didn't have the grain, he'd be given some beer. If he didn't have beer, he'd be given bread. If he didn't get bread, they could give him honey. And they knew the equivalent value of each one, so there no one felt cheated. You got you got honey, maybe you didn't need honey, but you could go and trade it down down the way. So it was like this this currency, uh, and which we would find very strange, I think, in this country. But it was something that made the society very close knit. When I lived in Egypt, they didn't have supermarkets. Uh, I've been back as I said several times. They they have them now, uh, beautiful supermarkets. But uh, where I was living in Minya, I'd walk into the the marketplace, and there was a woman that sold eggs. There was somebody that sold fruit, somebody sold vegetables. I bought my meat at a third place. It was very similar in that I had to talk to many people to get my meal for the day. And it reinforced that connection of community. Hmm. Uh, you know, we, we go to the grocery store, we might say some pleasantries to the, the checkout uh, uh, attendant, but uh, that might be it. You know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, You said uh, the 30 or 40 colonies, you said, is that is that a, any sense of the size of the apiary that it, since it was a government run industry actually some of the apiaries probably had hundreds of of beehives they, these things were uh, hollow hollow clay tubes that they, they uh, if they if they're made like they make them now they took mud and straw laid it out flat and then they rolled it around a, a bundle of sticks that would be a, a certain size let it dry in the sun and they would actually stack these like cordwood mm. and make walls of these the biggest one i saw had over 400 hives in it wow and uh, uh, they they were they were stamped with uh, a stamping system that told the beekeeper, oh, this was provided with wax at this season and what have you. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, it, it's interesting when you, as I point out in the question of perfect hive, uh, the oldest hive is still being used, and that's the horizontal hive. We got still have being used in parts of Egypt, but it's also being used in Azerbaijan and Iran. And, we, and, and so we find them in, in the Sudan. We find them uh, horizontal hives hanging from tree in Tanzania. Uh, that is that is the longest serving hive that and hive design that's still with us. Wow. Well, d- they definitely didn't uh, have any concerns about drift if they had a wall of hives like that. <laughs> Apparently <laughs> like not. And the, you know, the bees, I, I figure out the, one of the free, cl- cliches I use is, yeah, uh, we sometimes don't let bees be bees. Yeah. <laughs> They'll figure it out if they're in the wrong wrong place. Yep. <laughs> what you what you just brought up uh, conjures up this. Every time somebody, um, every time somebody talks about honey, they talk about how how long it lasts and it doesn't spoil. And they've found honey in 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 you know in tombs in Egypt, thousands of years old, and it's still good. Is that right? Well, I've only seen one sample of honey from a tomb, and it looked like tar. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't something that I would uh, I would uh, uh, want to necessarily to consume. Uh, but uh, uh, we do find a number of, of examples of. So, for example, a lot of a lot of tombs will actually have food provided for the deceased, and in some cases, that food is coated in honey. If it's like a dried uh, duck or what have you, uh, okay. we also we also know that they. Uh, uh, they use honey as a medicinal of uh, over 900 pharma, uh, pharma uh, 
pharmaceutical concoctions I, I read about, half of them had honey as part of the ingredients. Wow. Uh, okay. So that's kind of uh, interesting. A few had beeswax. Uh, most of the time, I think a lot of the times they, 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 I think the honey was to make it more palatable <laughs> for people to take, <laughs> but they, they used for burns and cuts. And, uh, the ancient Egyptians were thought to have the fi- finest physicians in the ancient world. In fact, when Persia came in and conquered Egypt, a lot of the physicians were taken back to Persia. Interesting. Okay. Well, so, so when you hear that the next time from somebody who's talking about honey, you can kind of believe it. It's probably pretty close to being true then. That's interesting. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, then then the quest for the perfect hive. And and that was the first book of yours that I ran into um, back then. And and so what is the perfect hive? The one thing I, is, you know, the, the, I don't want to give away the ending, but I think it's been out long <laughs> enough that the ending is out there. Uh, uh, one of the things that I've always admired about uh, beekeepers, if you look at the history, and uh, I know both of you are this way, I'm sure, is that we're tinkers. We're always trying to improve it. We're never satisfied. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I look at the the frame wars at the, pre- the beginning of the previous century where you had the, the deep frames and the small frames. And if it wasn't for some change in weather, we could have had a very different high than we have now. You know, uh, but uh, the question is, do we ha- actually have it? Uh, it? Would the perfect hive allow it would be uh, so inviting to hive beetles? Would the perfect hive be uh, something that would uh, uh, that would that would uh, cause that would not be ideally suited for the bees? I mean, think about the theory behind uh, skeps. Uh, round tree trunks are round. It, it, it allows for you know it's it it, it can be uh, depending on how it's constructed it can be relatively cool. It could be it it, it stands. Uh, uh, can withstand the, some of the elements. Uh, you may have to replace it every two or three years, but uh, in today's money, a typical skep would cost about 20 bucks. We can't buy a hive for 20 bucks. No, you can't. I, uh, the other thing I know about beekeepers is we're pretty frugal. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if you were able to, you know, uh, learn, if you knew how to drive your bees, and most people did by the time they, they stopped using the brimstone and, uh, and the pit, the flaming pit, uh, they would very easily uh, take a pail, set the full uh, the uh, the full skep upside down in the pail with uh, two pieces of wood with nails each end. They'd sort of brace another empty skep on the side uh, up on top, and they start banging the daylights out of the side of the pail. And the bees just sort of ran out of there and up into the empty one empty hive. They took that put back on the on the the step, and they were done. And it was a small enough space that they could. Uh, ex- uh, in my experience, I put in some. Uh, I have I actually used this skep for uh, a couple of years. Um, I have put in three pieces of comb and uh, as, as a guide at the top that uh, we know from Edmund Southern, who was the beekeeper during the, the, the who wrote the first book on English uh, beekeeping in 1594. So he's talking about skeps, put dowels, just little pieces of wood that it would hold the, the, this comb at the top and you put bees in there and see what they do. A week later, they had not only extended those three, but added three more. And within 30 days, they had filled the whole thing. Hmm. and uh it, it just yeah and i often wonder why is it that, that it took people so long to figure out the bee space the bees had to figure it out pretty well i went to, <laughs> I, went, I went expecting that i had to pry it off the, my bottom board no it just lifts off because the bees stopped <laughs> stopped on their own they had it figured out so uh, <laughs> uh but uh, uh in answer to your question i, I think uh, we're still looking and i think when and, and i think when beekeeping because first of all conditions are changing constantly the whole industry is changing constantly. The hive that uh, uh, the fundamental hive, if you look at some of the uh, uh, the, the uh, catalogs from 1920, if you saw, I, I've seen people's beehives look just like those. You know, we've got the genome of the honeybee. We got space age bees living in pre depression <laughs> depression era hives. And so the question I keep, I wonder, is that really the best hive? No. And so. I'm, I'm, my hope is the challenge be, is the challenge our our colleagues uh, to keep thinking out of the box and uh, and more and more people are trying things like the flow hive they're trying the worry hive they're trying uh, uh, that uh, that uh, uh, bee house from England that big plastic thing uh, it's a uh, it's it's kind of neat to see that happening. Now we explored some of those on that show that we did with those shows that we did of different kinds of hives. So yes, people are still looking. Um, and, and I, I, I think I agree. I don't think they're there yet. Um, Tom Seeley will tell you the, 
hollow trunk of a tree is the perfect hive, and I think he may be pretty close there, but they're a little difficult to manage. Yeah, the, yeah. I find that, but I, I really find that a, a, a breath of fresh air when, when Tom came out with talking about Darwinian beekeeping. Yes. Because yes. we've done every, if you look at, if you look at that list, what, how did the bees evolve in their natural cavities? And we've done everything we can to do it just the opposite. <laughs> and then we wonder why we're having issues. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. I, you, you've also done something on dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. And, and I can see with your bent towards history why you would be interested in dinosaurs. They're no longer here, I don't think. <laughs> well, uh, bir- birds. Birds. No, they're yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. What, what, why the interest in dinosaurs? Well, again, it's almost, I, I hate to be autobiographical, but when I was seven years old, uh, we bought those little boxes and this may have happened with, uh, Kim, you and I are about the same age, uh, that, that, that held six little mini Fritos corn chips bags. They were lunch size Fritos bags and, and 61, 62 and 63, they gave out a little dinosaur one. And I remember the first one, I still have this, you know, a, a beekeepers like historians keep a lot of things. <laughs> and I saw, I showed it to my mom and I said, what is this? And she said, that's a dinosaur. I said, what is that? And she said, look it up. Good mom. So I went to the, I went to the Google of 1962, the World Book Encyclopedia, and uh, looked it up, and it was fascinating. Just just like all little kids, just got uh, uh, got really uh, immersed into into dinosaurs. And I I teach an online class on dinosaur biology, and uh, the book I had been using went out of print, and uh, at, at a uh, a moment of weakness and uh, a couple single malt scotches, I decided I can write a book that would really serve my, because <laughs> the first book's your hardest. And Kim, you know, this is true. The first book's the hardest. Yes. But once you've done one, you think you can do them all. And, <laughs> and they get easier over time. And then you, of course, you run into things like the X, ABCs and you, <laughs> and you wonder, why did I do this? But, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, I thought, yeah, I can do this. And uh, so I wrote this book uh, called The Dinosaur Primer, which is a sort of a, a, a fundamental book to let people understand the, fun, the basics about dinosaur classification, biology, and so on. And uh, that's one of the texts that we use in my course. Insect mythology. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, uh, uh, those are two words I don't think I would have ever put together in a sentence until I read, read about that. Oh, yeah. Insect mythology has been uh, a longstanding interest of mine. Mostly it has to do with its cultural entomology. Uh, and and myths tell our history. They tell our, the stories of our beliefs through time. Uh, and uh, the uh, the book I wrote uh, is uh, co-authored by my friend, good friend, uh, uh, Ron Cherry. He used, taught, used to teach, I think he's retired or close to retirement now, at the University of Florida. He and I were in grad school together at Illinois. And we both had this love of mythology. And so... Uh, I just started noticing noticing insects everywhere. Uh, my wife Jessie is a a, a a jeweler, a silversmith. Uh, she um, does a, has a lot of uh, a, ancient amulets in her uh, in her designs, but also a lot of bee stuff. She's uh, done things like skep hives and the honeybee hieroglyph and things like that. But uh, going to art museums with her uh, and her background in art history, I was getting I was getting really amazed and fascinated. And then we start looking at it. Insects and bees are almost everywhere. You can <laughs> you go to any art museum. You're, I've actually put together a list. I had to, I had to send this to uh, Bee Culture. Uh, I've had a uh, the Beekeeper's Guide to the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, <laughs> and it's basically Ooh, where you yeah. uh, okay that would be you're fun. Going, you're going to New York, and uh, your 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 uh, your kids or your wife wants to see the museum uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. You may or may not have the same interest, but if you knew where to look for the bee stuff, you'll That'd see a cool. lot more and, and really, and really get into it way, way more. And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, the, the last time I was at the Met and a lot of this is ancient Egyptian stuff. They've got a whole collection of things like wax, uh, wax figurine, beeswax stuff and what have you. But I remember going up to a, the second floor and all of a sudden here's somebody it's called the, the beekeeper and some guy is sitting on a stool with a big, big long, uh, pipe and he's looking at his skep. And it was a painting that was on a special exhibit. I didn't expect it to be there. Or when I went to the uh, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts the last time, uh, they had a Wyeth exhibit. And one of the paintings was of an old German flat-topped skep with his dog next to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of course, the painting was so well done 
you could actually decipher how it was assembled. Uh, and uh, it gave me a lot of insight into how those flat top hives with the spike on the top uh, were made until I had a chance to actually uh, see some more of them in, uh, when I was in Paris. Amazing. Very good. Gene, this, is, this has been wonderful <laughs> and amazing. And we've talked about cicadas and dinosaurs and ancient insects and lots more stuff. I'm, I'm so glad you were, be able, you were able to be with us today. And I don't want to wait 10 years to talk to you again. How's that? That sounds, I, I'd enjoy coming back again. There's a lot of neat stuff happening out here that I'm, I'm working on and uh, it'd be fun to talk about. Okay. Good. All right. Well, Jeff, have we missed anything? I don't think so, Gene. Anything you want to say in, in closing, we will have all your contact information and a and, uh, list of books mm -hmm. and everything on our website and in the show notes. Sure. Yeah, the, it's it's really not it's not pertinent. I'll, I'll just mention this in passing, uh, not so much that the audience wants it, but uh, you know, one of the things I've done recently is I created an app called Cicada Safari. And it's a uh, an app where people can go out and go on their own Cicada Safari and they see a cicada, they take a picture and they submit it to our our uh our, our, through the app to our website. And that picture is examined by my colleagues and I who uh, verify that every picture we get is of a periodical cicada. And I'm happy to tell you that right now we have received 194,000 downloads <laughs> and 564,000 photographs. Oh my over gosh. a half a million photographs just this year. But what's more exciting is we've already looked at all all of them, all of them and checked them out. We Amazing, kept up and that's all been in the last uh, six weeks. Yeah, that's so. Short so, Jeff, we got to get how to get that app on on uh, on the web page. We'll have we'll yeah, have they, that in our show notes yeah. and then on the website. All right, yeah, it'll probably Good. by the time this airs, the cicadas may be done, but there's there'll, there'll be more coming out in 2024 and 2025. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Explore, right. Gene. Again, thank you for your time. And and all of this, um, I'm just going to have to sit down and digest it for a week or two. So, <laughs> no. uh, it's been fun. All yes, right. it has. Thank you. We look forward to having you back. Thank you. You too. You all stay healthy and uh, uh, hope uh, hope the bees are doing well for you. <laughs> you bet. I will say that the day before I went out mapping cicadas, I had to stop at my research hive and I, I installed a new package and a couple of weeks earlier, and I was had to see how they were doing. So it's. Uh, I've been mixing beekeeping in with my cicadas quite a bit. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Thanks again, Gene. Oh, All thank right. you. Appreciate it. Have Take a good care. day. Bye-bye. Hey, I was really happy to have Gene on the show. You know, we should have had him at the beginning of our Hive Types uh, series. Yeah. What a wealth of information. That would have been a good idea. Yep. Yeah. That would have been a good idea. But this was uh, this was, this was was pretty amazing. He's He's got his fingers in in. An amazing number of pots he's got going on. I was just fascinated listening to him. I've known him for quite a few years since he came out with his uh, In Search of the Perfect Hive book is when I got to know him. But um, I didn't know anything about the, his interest in cicadas then. I knew a little bit about his work in Egypt and some of that, but... Um, it was good to have him here today. I hope people enjoy it. Well, you wouldn't have known about his work in cicadas unless you hit him on that 17th year somewhere along the line. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Well, he, he was, he was um, um, I, I was particularly interested in his work with, with the, uh, uh, the mythology of entomology insects mm. and how they, how they def, you know, kind of tell the culture that I had never thought of that insect mythology, two words. Like I said, I was two words that I've never put in the same sentence. Yeah, really. Same sentence. Y mythology, you hear of unicorns and, <laughs> and, yeah. and flying horses yeah. or whatever, but it's uh, n never the insect. So that's, that's interesting. And my ears definitely perked up when he yep. talked about going back to Egypt and doing archeological um, travels and, and exploration of beekeeping in Egypt, ancient be Egypt. And I was saying, boy, that would be, be fun to go to. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to just ride around with him for a while. I think that would be fun. Maybe we can get the podcast to to, to fly us out to uh, Egypt with him and report from the ground. Yeah, there's a good chance that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, <but that's>, okay, <laughs> a definite chance that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the thing, the the, the age old question, the honey they found in an ancient pyramid in Egypt after thousands of years was still honey. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's happened several times. So 
Um, I guess I guess when people are talking about honey, not are talking about honey lasting forever, they're pretty close to right. Yeah, yeah, that is, that was really interesting. Hear it, hear it directly. I think we're done here, Jeff. It's been a been a good day. It is. Well, that wraps up this episode. It's been a fun one. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of the Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their full probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for joining us as a supporter. Check out all the great beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at Beekeeping Today podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that about wraps it up, Jeff. It's been a good show. I feel like I should go watch Indiana Jones and with a different perspective. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>